Have you ever watched a movie that was so bad it's good? Well, these aren't those movies. Welcome to So Bad It's Bad, where we watch bad movies so you don't have to. I'm your co-host, Nick Ogle. I'm Tebow Drake. You know, the funniest thing happened to me last night. I was just lounging on the couch watching my favorite Japanese claymation show, Mutato. Oh, I, you know, I, I actually love that show. It's one of my favorites. It's, so, it's just adorable, you know? Well, anyways, I was watching the show in my microwave, and then all of a sudden, a spaceship crash lands on my dog. Are you, wait, are you serious? It, like, is the dog? Hey, that sounds pretty bad, man. I'm like, uh, unfortunately, he didn't survive, but it gets weirder. Uh, some strange robot woman just waltzed out of the spaceship and turned my dad into a cyborg. Like, what the heck, man? Are you serious? Yeah. You know, that's so weird. That sounds exactly like a movie I happened to watch last night. Uh, you know, you might have watched it. I don't know, but uh, Sheborg, uh, you may know it as Sheborg Massacre. I did watch that movie. I love that movie. Want to talk about it? Sure. All right. So some facts about Sheborg for our uh, unenlightened listeners. Uh, the film was released in 2016. Uh, it is an hour and a half long, and it has a four out of 10 rating on IMDb. And it was directed and written by a fellow named Daniel Armstrong. So the film stars Whitney Duff, as our protagonist, Dylan, Daisy Masterman as Eddie, her uh, hat-wearing sidekick, and J.C. Holt as a nerd with purple hair, who we'll be referring to as Purple Hair Girl because we don't know her name, and the coolest name I've ever seen in a bad movie, or a good movie, to be honest, Tommy Hellfire, who plays Sam the Cop. And as our main antagonist, we have Verity East, who does not play the Sheborg. She actually plays Dr. Cyborg. And of course, uh, the ever not present villain, uh, Emma Louise Wilson, plays Sheborg. And uh, the synopsis of Sheborg is when an alien fugitive crash lands into a local, local puppy farm and begins turning people into machines that feed on puppy flesh, Dylan and her BFF, Eddie, have to decide whether or not to take on the Sheborg menace and save the world. All right, let's get into it. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay. So this movie begins, like any good movie does, by trying to give the viewer epilepsy, because one of the opening credits, opening production company credits, is like just a series of flashing white lights. Um, yeah. And I was very concerned when it happened. Uh, and then we smoothly transition from that to some nice dubstep, um, and we're introduced to our lead characters, uh, Eddie and Dylan. And uh, Dylan, she's a bit of an anarchist. She doesn't, she doesn't believe in, uh, in the government or any sort of structure or regulations, uh, much to the chagrin of her father, who is the mayor of this town that it takes place in somewhere in Australia. Uh, no, no, sorry, Mr. Whiteman or White Man. Yeah, I don't know how he would say his last name. I White hope Man. that's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, so uh, Dylan is spray painting the uh, police car uh, with an anarchy symbol um, over the hood. And Eddie is trying to convince her to uh, not be part of the anarchy philosophy, um, at which point the cops show up and start chasing Dylan and Eddie and lead us directly into our opening credit sequence, which I loved. Amazing. It's one of the best I've actually seen in a movie, I think, you know, for a while. I oh, yeah, so. definitely. Definitely. Uh, it kind of, it's reminiscent a bit of Scooby-Doo because it shows the cops chasing after Dylan and Eddie, like, and they'll peek around corners and stuff. Um, on across. Like, they on do the walking across the screen uh, thing that they always do in Scooby-Doo. Uh, and it's very fun. And it's set to a very uh, well-chosen song. Yes. I believe that's the first punk rock song that they have. In the, the, whole, the whole movie is basically set to a punk rock. That's the soundtrack. It's, a, it's really, I, I think it fit very well for many reasons. Yeah, me too. I'm 
there is a punk rock band in the movie. Uh, so that was definitely fitting in that regard. Um, and it also just made the movie a lot more fun, a lot more enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, anyways, uh, after our credits sequence, uh, the cops catch Dylan and Eddie um, and they celebrate with a nice fist bump. Uh, and then we not very smoothly transition to outer space where um, Sheborg is introduced and she is being sentenced to uh, some sort of punishment by these this, uh, species of white haired, uh, very pale aliens who have they captured kind of, her. They look like they would be in a punk band actually now, now that I think of it. <laughs> That's true, they do, yeah. Black rings around their eyes, you know, they, they're reminiscent of another character who comes into the movie later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um anyways, uh but Seaborg is not pleased with her sentencing. Uh so she escapes um and she uh disintegrates a woman by vomiting on her. She disintegrates one of the uh one of the white-haired people just by vomiting on them. We never really get to see that happen again. I was kind of disappointed. That's true, that that did never happen again. <laughs> Um, and anyways, this is the point when the gore is introduced, and the gore effects in this movie are incredible. Phenomenal. The, I, I would argue they're some of the best practical effects I've seen for, like, the budget. It's just very low. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the first Evil Dead movie, which also has very good gore effects, very similar to this one. Um, and so anyways, Sheborg fights all of these aliens, and she kills all but one. Um, and then she goes off in an escape pod, and the one remaining alien follows her. And the shot of the escape pods chasing after each other is ridiculous, and it looks stupid, but it, it's pretty entertaining um, like, because they're so small. And the CGI in this movie is not quite on par with the practical effects, unfortunately. It's like imagine two like air pods without the <laughs> facing each other probably about what it looks like <laughs> yeah <laughs> With fun. okay and then uh we are back to dylan and eddie who have been put into a holding cell um and they were introduced to another character named rick who is the lead singer of a punk band uh who dylan does not like very much uh okay. in fact her her response to um uh, him telling her that he's in a band is for her to just swear at him and tell him to stop talking to her, uh, which <laughs> I thought was funny. Um, <laughs> but uh, Eddie, on the other hand, is very much into Rick, and she likes the fact that he is in a band. That's um, pretty. I, I don't think there's any other reason that she likes him. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, definitely not his uh, his charm because he doesn't have very much of that. Anyways, um, so they get uh, yeah. bailed out of prison um, by Dylan's dad, who we previously mentioned. He is the mayor, um, and he is very upset with Dylan. He doesn't like that she is an anarchist. He definitely doesn't like that she's going to jail. Um, and he gets so mad that he slaps her across the face, uh, and then he sends her away uh, in a chauffeured vehicle. <clears throat> uh, anyways. Oh, oh she calls him a. He says, uh, "I grew up with a fascist dad." She she <laughs> constantly says that he is a fascist. So yeah, I'm yes. not sure if she understands what that means, but I think it's <laughs> the way it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like him. Um, okay. Uh, anyways, I think it's also important at this point to mention the transitions um, because this was a noticeable transition that was cool. Transitions are a little hit or miss in this movie, but the dad shuts the car door and uh, the transition moves along with the car door uh, to the next scene. That's an example of a good transition. An example of a bad transition is this like circle transition that they keep using. Um, and it's weird, it's not your traditional circle transition, which looks bad enough as it is, unless your movie is like made in the forties, but there's like this like, I don't know, maybe two inch like, look like out around the edge of the motion piece of like blur 
So it draws so much attention to the transition that it's extremely distracting. Um, and they use that one like maybe 10 times. So get used to it if you're going to watch sheep work. But you should. You should watch sheep. You it's really good. should. You really should. Uh, okay. So then we are introduced to Purple Haired Girl, who is checking out the stars with her telescope. And she sees something she doesn't recognize, um, which happens to be the escape pod falling, but she doesn't know it yet. So she thinks, OK, I'm just going to go investigate that. And off she goes. And that's the end of that scene. All of the scenes in this movie are about like a minute long. So if it sounds like we're jumping around a lot, that's just how the movie is. Um, OK, so then we get to see the spaceship crash land uh, and our very first uh, canine casualty of the film. Um, um, uh, basically, there's a man walking his dog, and he gets down to tie his shoe, and out of nowhere, a spaceship lands in front of him, and he's, oh, thank God, that didn't crush me, but, well, he spoke a little too soon, because uh, Shibor comes crashing down right on top of him, uh, ending him, and eventually the puppy. It's very sad. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. And so then uh, we are introduced to the puppy farm, uh, which is an important location in this movie. Um, and the first half of the movie pretty much takes place only at this puppy farm. Um, anyways, so uh, Sheborg shows up at the puppy farm uh, and kills one of the security guards um, with her tongue, which is a cool effect until you get a close look at it. And it clearly is just a piece of plastic. But when it's moving and it's coming out of her mouth, it looks really cool. Um, and then they have like close-ups of it and it, it's very stiff and unrealistic looking. Yes. All right, so next up, uh, we have the concert scene uh, in which Rick uh, and his band are performing at a venue. Uh, and it's very sad and lame looking. There's like maybe 10 people there. Uh, and two of them are Eddie and Dylan. So uh, why don't you tell us how that interaction transpires, Steve-O? Uh, I'm, try I'm trying to remember. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on that scene. OK. Um, so after they've finished performing, uh, Rick comes over and talks to uh, Eddie and Dylan. Um, and Eddie uh, wants to compliment him, but just can't find the right words. So she says, you're just so. And then there's like, this is a weird scene. There's like a 20 second, 30 second pause. Um, and it just cuts to a close up of Dylan for some reason. And Dylan never talks or <laughs> even reacts or anything like that. It's just a close up of, of Dylan. Uh, and then it cuts back to Eddie. And then she says, Sonic, you are so Sonic. It's a great compliment. I, I'm sure that any guitarist or singer would like to receive that compliment. That's true. Um, so anyways, uh, this was the point when I realized that Rick was the actor who played Rick. Uh, I called him multiple times, both the best and worst actor in the world, uh, because he has no sense of charisma or charm or energy to his performance whatsoever. He's completely deadpan and like just dead, but it's really funny. And I, I hope it was intentional. Yeah. But I think at this point, he offer, well, he doesn't offer, he talks about the puppy farm and he's wearing, he's wearing a puppy, like save the puppies uh, shirt, which I thought was funny. And he, oh, I hate the puppy farm, you know, which is uh, the equivalent of a puppy mill where they, except it's very much worse. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so he, he offers uh, Eddie and Dylan to break into the puppy farm. And normally Dylan would be, you know, all for breaking into property and vandalizing, but she actually does not want to. And Eddie is the one that has to convince her to go to the puppy farm. But eventually she gives in, I believe, and they do end up, uh, well, yes. I think that's. Uh, one noteworthy thing is during the scene where, well, two noteworthy things happen during the scene where Eddie convinces Dylan to go to the puppy farm, which happens at one of their apartments. It's never quite clear whose it is. Um, one is we're introduced to Mutato, which is an important part of the story. 
Um, and it's this like stop motion thing that the director made. And it's like a Godzilla parody. And it's in Japanese, I think. Uh, and it, it, it's adorable. It's, it's this <laughs> little stop motion. Uh, and everybody's watching it. And it, it, it becomes a running joke. In the movie, and I think it's fantastic. Um, the next scene, is, or the next important thing that happens in that scene is there's moments where uh, Eddie tries to appeal to Dylan uh, by making her kind of feel bad for the puppies. And she does this by pretending to be a puppy and barking like a puppy, um, except for instead of having the actress like bark, you know, they just dub over her with actual barking sound effects, which is an interesting choice to say the least. Um, <laughs> And then I think also at that point, there's a line where someone, I think uh, Eddie says, it's as plain as the face of a Bulgarian pinup, uh, which is definitely a thought provoking line. What does that mean? No one knows. You know. Um, okay, so then we are introduced to reintroduced to the one like white haired alien that escaped in the escape pod that crash landed next to Sheborg's escape pod. Um, and this is our first fight scene. Um, and it looks like two little kids playing for me. Uh, the it, fight scene between Sheborg and the alien. I, I think that there was one part where the white haired woman was like walking through the woods and Sheborg was like nowhere to be found. I thought it was pretty tense. They they kind of cut out all the audio and it was kind of, that kind of yeah. it might have been unintentional, but if it was intentional, it was it was decent. And then, you know, Sheborg comes up and I believe uh, doesn't, I think Sheborg stabs uh, the white haired woman in the neck. And then when she falls to the ground, she like stomps on her head or something. Yeah. Um, and all of the like, like head crushing or face punching or uh, what's another thing? Rolling over with card, all of that kind of stuff in this movie just is like awful. I don't know what they did to it, but like it's it's like too fast and it looks really fake and it's just it's weird and it's yeah. funny at the same time because it's a little too like fast and it feels over the top. I don't know, um, but that was true of the head crushing scene, mm -hmm. um, which in my opinion was on par with the famous uh, cake head crushing scene in the classic film Low Blow starring Leo Fong and Cameron Mitchell. So, high praise. Okay. But, um, worthy thing uh, with the, the head crushing, it releases all the green goo, and uh, later on that reappears with purple-haired girl, which... Yes, yes. The green goo is important. Um, so, okay, then we are uh, reintroduced to... Oh, before we are reintroduced to uh, Dil Dylan and Eddie, um, there's a scene where Purple Haired Girl is investigating, and I think she does find the green goo. Yes, but she she's discovered by Seaborg, Seaborg, um, in a pretty cool, like little horror scene. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty decently shot, um, where Seaborg kind of jumps out at uh, Purple Haired Girl. The camera work is very impressive, very Evil Dead esque, <laughs> um, and then. Uh, purple hair girl isn't killed for some reason. She just gets captured by Seaborg. Okay. Um, then we're reintroduced to Eddie and Dylan, who are in the singer's uh, Rick's car, um, and they're at the puppy farm. And Rick is, you know, like a good gentleman, offers them some acid before they go and break into the puppy farm, um, which they politely decline. But Rick. Uh, partakes in himself. Yes, quite a bit too. And he yeah, doesn't, doesn't to seem say, to affect him at all, though. Yeah, he's tolerance. <laughs> he's only taken three today. <laughs> <laughs> the three, what? We don't know because he just kind of goes like this in a tin. And then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're actually mints. <laughs> um, so then there's some sneaking around scenes, which are pretty funny, especially the physical comedy by Rick's after, um, very over the top. And uh, Rick uh, is deadpan as possible, uh, but also as emphatic as possible somehow, says, 
get the bolt cutters. Um, I didn't do that injustice, but uh, you just need to watch the movie to find out for yourself mm -hmm. how, how glorious that line is. Okay, so um, when they first introduce the uh, trope that is very common in movies where they're breaking into things where uh, they don't have bolt cutters, obviously. So uh, Dylan asks, does anyone have a hairpin? And Eddie's like, oh, no, I don't have a hairpin. But Rick is like, oh, yeah, I have one right here. You know, and that happens quite a, uh, well, I think it only happens twice. But the fact that it happens twice is already a little strange because how many people carry hairpins realistically, you know? That's true. It's true. Um, <clears throat> so uh, then we get some incredible camera work that, like, leads us through kind of the puppy farm and into what I call the dog death chamber which is just this room with a bunch of puppy guts like all over the place uh, and like intestines and stuff and spaghetti. Um, <laughs> and anyways, so they discover that room um, and they're all very you know, shocked and then grossed out by it. Um, but they have some worse things to look forward to because Eddie is very freaked out by possibly the least menacing shot I've ever seen in my life, um, where she's like, oh my God, guys, look at that. Um, and it's, but it's just a shot of like this very unmenacing pose. It's the security guard who got killed by she Borg. Um, and he's just like standing there and the lighting isn't quite right. So it looks like, it, it just, it does, it looks sad. Yeah, and it lasts in way too long. It's yeah. Good 10 seconds before he actually does anything. Um, and then he also tries to do that thing in movies where like robots or cyborgs will kind of like twitch their head, you know, in a robotic way. Um, but the way he does it is like how I just did it. It looks really human. Um, and so, yeah, exactly. We get some of that uh, prior to the fight between uh, mostly Dylan and Eddie. Rick pretty, he stays out of the fight pretty much. Um, I don't <laughs> and then runs away when he gets the chance. Um, uh, but anyways, uh, Dylan and Eddie fight the security Borg. Um, Ed Eddie takes a brief intermission to check her phone, but there's no reception, uh, which I thought was a pretty bad joke. Uh, but what I thought it led into was pretty cool, which is where the security bot Borg uh, actually licks Eddie's phone and like drains the energy from it. And then like his face is turning like, blue and it's really cool and it's a cool image i like that a lot but, um <laughs> and so anyways get power that, that's how they like regenerate their their life i don't know yes it makes them stronger mm -hmm. um and so anyways the fight continues for a while uh, at one point security board takes dylan and eddie's heads and smashes them together but they add a digital after effect of like dust going everywhere. So I don't know how dirty they were, but that must have been pretty significant for that to happen. Uh, anyways, uh, so the, the climax of the battle happens when Security Borg is choking uh, Dylan, or Eddie, sorry, and her screaming is really bad. I thought Eddie's actress was very good for the most part, but I think she can't pull off a good hearty scream very well. It's very silly sounding. Um, but uh, at this point, uh, Dylan kills the security Borg um, with a shovel. What is this when the shovel is introduced? I don't remember what she killed him with. I believe so. Yeah, so with a shovel. Um, but the, <laughs> the sound design for this is not very good. There's like this weird, like squishy, like it's, I don't know. It reminded me of like the slime that you make at home when you squish that. That's what it sounds like when she smashes his head in. Uh, so it made me laugh a little bit. Um, so anyways, uh, after that ordeal, uh, we get to see what Rick has been up to in the span since he ran away and the security board got defeated. Um, and we're introduced to him right away, just screaming his lungs out. Uh, <laughs> and anyways, uh, he has been put in the dog kennel. Uh, he, what's that? With purple haired girl and with, a random. And uh, the cyborg that we called Pink Scrubs, which is just a cyborg that's wearing pink scrubs, uh, which eats uh, a puppy right in front of them. 
Do you want to describe what the what the puppy corpses look like in this movie, Tebow? They're sort of. It, it's kind of problematic because the the gore of puppies are amazing and it looks super realistic. But then you look at the actual puppy and the puppy looks like a. It's so obviously a stuffed animal. <laughs> I didn't even try to hide it. I, I don't remember if I if I don't know if I'm remembering it wrong or if it was je- just like this, but I. Remember them all looking the same? Like they were all just white, like generic white puppies? I think so, yeah. Yeah. But they're not very good. They're definitely one of the worst practical practical effects in the movie. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. um, Then, I don't know, this part, the next part of the movie gets a little repetitive. There's a lot of like back and forth going to this car, going to that car, running into this cyborg, running into that cyborg. Um, So anyways, uh, I think what this part does do well is establish the chemistry between Dylan and Eddie. I think both of those actresses are very talented and they both pull off that, the friendship that those characters have really well, especially in these scenes when it's just them together and nobody else. Um, Anyways, uh, so uh, they decide they hear uh, Rick, who is signaling them. They had established earlier in the movie a little like caca, caca thing if something goes wrong. Um, and Rick must have been nearby when that happened because he, he does it and they go to rescue him um, at the kennel. And um, <laughs> so they, they go there uh, and Eddie says, to Pink Scrubs before they attack her and uh, not defeat, but uh, temporarily inconvenience her. Uh, Eddie says, try picking on someone my size, which is either a really clever line or a really stupid line, and I don't know which. No one knows. <laughs> I don't even know what it means, like, to be honest. So, I don't know. Yes, but I, at this point, I believe that Pink Scrubs does attack them and they try to fight her. And I think that this is when they try to let them out. Oh, yeah. This is the puppy escape scene, which is really cool. They let all the puppies out and they kind of, it's like a slow motion shot, I think, of just a bunch of puppies running around. It's pretty cute. Yeah. Those puppies are real. The alive puppies are actual puppies. So that improves Uh, me a lot. Thank God the alive ones are real and not the, the. (laughs) <laughs> dead one. it's turned into apocalypse now all of a sudden or they're dead animal actual dead animals um yeah. okay so uh there's a scene where they kill a cyborg with a weed whacker which i thought was well done especially how it kind of the camera kind of pans very quickly to each character after it happens to see their reactions camera work in this movie is absolute gold it's a masterpiece um so anyways um this is i think uh when they kill the first cyborg officially um using the green goo um and i think uh it was purple the the beard. Beard. That? wasn't it the guy with the beard yeah he was yeah. the guy that uh pink scrubs turned him into a cyborg mm-hmm. uh, and i think what happened is purple haired girl uh, threw the, the jar at him or something in an act of frustration or confusion or something like that. Not really expecting it to do much, but it ends up like melting him and the practical effects are awesome. Uh, and so you get the wide shot of like the corpse and it looks like like a paper mache human being is on the ground. Uh, but the actual melting scene is really well done. And then uh, at this point, I think they're trying, they, they want to leave but they can't because they don't have the keys because Rick has the keys. So I think the, then, then it cuts back to Rick and he is having a not so pleasant experience. <laughs> a, another common thing in this movie, probing. This movie <laughs> it, loves its probes. It loves probing for no reason whatsoever. They never, you know, why do aliens probe? We don't know. They just do it. They just like it. Okay. Uh, I think uh, this is the point where 
uh, they are going to go get Rick or something, and uh, they run into Dr. Cyborg, who's kind of the main antagonist of the movie, um, which she was an evil doctor who worked at the puppy farm who got turned into a cyborg, um, and now she's trying to kill Dylan and Eddie. Um, but Dylan's got a few tricks up her sleeve, including an embarrassing cartwheel and uh, a barbed wire knuckle punch to the face. Um, and then this weird scene where after the uh, Dr. Cyborg has kind of been incapacitated by her face kind of being torn up by the barbed wire, Dylan like stands on her face and then tries to balance on it. Uh, and it's a weird shot. It's kind of POV from Dr. Cyborg's perspective, which makes it even stranger. Uh, so yeah, you know, I guess you gotta give this movie credit for having interesting kills. Yeah. It is um, and then I, I think at this point they, they run away and they find the clearing with uh, puppy bodies everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then there's a this is one of the more messed up shots uh, in the movie, or one of the most uh, more messed up moments. There's like a, a half, uh, like a like half a puppy that's still alive, whimpering, and it was the puppy from earlier that was killed uh, in the when the spaceship crash landed. It's so how I, no one knows how it's still alive after <laughs> much time, but it is. And its and guts so, are like all strewn out and stuff. Gross, and it, it looks really real. Yeah, Actually, even like the puppy itself looked convincing, which was weird. Like it was moving. And and then uh, Dylan takes the collar off the puppy and like wipes off the blood, and you can see the name. And it's a simple. Puppy, I think. Yeah, I don't even know what the name is. It was like a weirdly symbolic thing that actually had no meaning. I don't even. I I thought it was her dog. That's what my theory was, but. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, they, they make it seem really revelatory that the dog has a name, but it doesn't affect the story in, it, in any way. Um, okay, so uh, then uh, they discover that Rick has been, he's dead. I guess he's been probed to death, <laughs> but um, his guts are like all spewed out, like they open the back door of the car or something and his, he falls out. It's a pretty cool shot. Um, it's amazingly done. Uh, anyways, um, so then uh, they go to Purple Haired Girl's van to get away. And uh, this was one of my favorite scenes in the movie um, because any, any like car related scene in this movie for some reason is absolutely amazing. Um, because what happens is this is an action scene where um, they're all getting in the van but at the last second, Pink Scrubs, the cyborg, jumps into the van. Um, and Dylan is not fully into the van when the van, they have to take off. Um, and so Dylan is hanging off the back door of the van. And Eddie has to fight Pink Scrubs in the van. And it keeps coming back and forth between the two of them. And it's awesome because it looks like they really, like that actress that played Dylan was really hanging off of the back and the side of the van and like climbing around it and stuff. Um, and it, it didn't look like Eddie was really fighting a cyborg, but hey, I'm willing to excuse a few, you know, inconveniences visually for the sake of an awesome car scene. Great, great. And it was also, you could tell it was done herself because she was climbing, like in most of those scenes, they climb around the cars really fast, but no one's really going to do that when they do it. So she's like, oh, slowly. And it, it was really intense. Like carefully, you know, yeah. So I if you were to do that for some reason good job uh i forgot her name daisy masterman was that the name a whitney duff is who oh. dylan is oh okay um all right <laughs> anyways uh so uh one during the fight scene between uh eddie and the cyborg there's one scene in particular that really stood out to me where uh eddie bites off doc uh pink scrubs ear um, and then blood like splatters all over the window. Um, and Pink Scrubs is understandably very mad about that. And grabs Eddie, pushes her face into the, the ear blood and smears it across, smears her face across the blood, um, a, which is a very disturbing scene. He's like, like really pushed up against it. Like it was crazy. Like, 
took me by surprise. I didn't expect that to happen, you know. This movie mm-hmm. just has get a da- Daniel Armstrong has some strange ideas. Hey, if you he, give him a little bit more of a budget, he could be the next Ari Aster, okay? Um, so, and then this is when we're introduced to the idea that uh, it's not a way to kill cyborgs, but it is helpful. One thing that you can do is next to their, all of the cyborgs have this like eye on their face and it's this just mechanical eye, except for cyborg has like a full body get up. Um, but the human cyborgs or the humans that have been turned into cyborgs have just one eye. And next to that eye is a bunch of wires. If you pull out those wires, then the cyborgs shut down until they're reactivated. Um, and so that ha- that's how they defeat pink scrubs. And that's very important later on. What else is important later on is the mayor. And we're reintroduced to that guy. Great man. When they drive to City Hall in their van. <laughs> I know, I know what you said. That was so funny. In their van. <laughs> it was like weirdly specific. They are in their van. They were. Then, so they're in the office of the mayor and there's like a ton of people in there for me. There's like cops and ran a, a lot of cops basically and and it's the three girls and they're completely covered like head to toe in blood and <laughs> no one's even suspecting that they murdered someone or anything but they so they're talking to the mayor and trying to get him to be like like you know send people to investigate because they're saying there's an alien invasion like we're all gonna die and no one's listening to them so they're they're of course they're angry you know uh, and th- so anyways, then they go to uh, to Dylan's father uh, to try to get to him directly. Um, and they're all kind of talking at the same point. And the camera work is like, it's really cool. It's, you know, showing each one. Um, and their, their actors are kind of overacting a little bit, but it's pretty funny. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, Dylan, like everybody kind of stops talking and Dylan just says, dad. That's super dramatic, and there's like this dramatic sting, and then a really dramatic zoom in onto the dad's face. Um, but I don't get why, because what what's so dramatic about her saying her dad's name? I don't know. <laughs> no one knows. Voice is Daniel Armstrong. I don't know what you, what what you think. I guess I gotta ask him. Uh, I gotta go to Australia and find him track them down i don't know um so anyways then the dad instead of you know like a typical dad in like a movie where they don't really believe the kids or whatever because something crazy is going on where they're just like "Eh, i don't know you know have you been seeing things you know you know have you been taking a lot of drugs whatever uh he's like get out i'm gonna put you in prison um (laughs) and so that's what happens they get put into prison um and uh, um, what we are introduced at this point to Tommy Hellfire's character, uh, who Dylan kind of asks him to look into the puppy farm um, situation, but he says that he doesn't believe her story about aliens and cyborgs, mm-hmm. um, but he is still going to investigate. He's still going to investigate the break-in. Yeah. So um, but then there's the fight, I believe, is next. Yes. Um, so uh, during, while they're in prison, um, Eddie gets very, like, mean all of a sudden. And she starts, like, demeaning Dylan for all of her trauma. She's like, you think just because your mom died and your dad's abusive that you can act so emotional all the time? <laughs> And then, uh, you know, Dylan slaps Eddie um, and that initiates this fight um, where they kind of build up to the fight very dramatically. Dylan says, okay. And Eddie says, okay. And then Dylan says, okay. And it keeps building up and up. And I thought that was kind of a funny little uh, kind of parody of the typical like fight uh, scenes and movies, how they're built up. Um, And then, the fight is shockingly violent for a fight between two friends. I they're really uh, going punching each other, like slamming their faces on the ground. <laughs> really they 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 get put I'm surprised none of them died. Like they really beat them. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so anyways, uh, then after that, we get uh, the fight, as the fight's kind of dying down, we get my favorite scene in the whole movie, which I'll describe in great detail. Um, and this scene is called the whole lot of love scene. So. Denial. Uh, previously in the movie, there was a scene where Tommy Hellfire had talked to like a receptionist. Um, but anyways, uh, we see this receptionist walking down the street. Um, and then a very quick pan up to a store sign that reads whole lot of love, like the Led Zeppelin song. Um, and then it pans right back down to the woman um, and in the time that it had panned up to the sign, a cyborg, uh, Dr. Cyborg, had shown up and is now attacking the receptionist. And we see that happen for about a second before the camera pans back up really quickly again to a whole lot of love. And then the scene ends and it's like 10 seconds long. And it made me laugh for maybe four minutes after it happened. <laughs> it's weird, weird, weird. Uh, and then we're introduced to the remainder of Rick's band and what happened to them. Um, so they're jamming out, you know, one girl is, you know, pulling the old Jimi Hendrix and trying to play the guitar with her teeth. Uh, but the guitar is like maybe six inches away from her mouth and it's very clearly fake. Um, Nick. What's that? He's using her six foot long tongue. Oh, I guess so. <laughs> I didn't need that image in my head. But, um, okay, so... <laughs> Then they, they play for a little while, they jam out, and they're like, hey, where's Rick? I don't know. Um, and then Dr. Cyborg shows up uh, to spoil their fun, wearing a sack on her head. Sort of like a... Jason, right? Yeah. Yeah, in yeah. Friday the 13th Part 2, Jason, before his hockey mask, wears a sack over his head with one eye hole, actually. So almost exactly like that, um, because it, she has one eye hole over her cyborg eye for some reason. It is. Uh, it's kind of eye hole because <laughs> it's like really. It's just. It looks the the mask itself looks stupid because it's a striped like pink striped mask. Yeah, I think it's like a shirt that like was just lying around that the director had just like yeah oh, wear this. Um, yeah. It, it's pretty bad, um, she, but anyways, uh, so then. Uh, she, she tells the punk band, like, I'm going to kill all of you and begins to attack them. But before we get to see that happen, uh, we show, uh, the, we see the aftermath of the prison fights. Um, and it's just a cut to uh, Dylan and Eddie uh, sitting down with, <laughs> with uh, these tissues, like, stuffed up their nose. They've got bloody noses. Um, but the tissues are, like, comically large. <laughs> mustache it looks like a bad mustache yeah <laughs> um so anyways uh that scene lasts about five seconds i don't even know what they say or they talk about in that scene it does um, you know. <laughs> oh they, that, actually what they do talk about is the hair bands i almost forgot yes actually you're right it does matter it's very important do you want to describe the hair band scene to you Bo? yeah so i believe they're trying to escape right and uh -huh. they need uh to open the lock the lock so of course you know a hair band uh, a hairpin a hair band is what they call them for some reason is yeah. is need so you know of course purple haired girl has a hairpin somehow and none, none of the people who have hairpins look like they would need them like their hairstyles really don't look like hairpin worthy hairstyles yeah purple hair girl has kind of a short like bob style hair if i remember correctly um and then rick has like greasy uncombed long punk rock hair uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyways after that scene um we are smoothly transitioned into a very very graphic and up close scene of probing oh yeah <laughs> i don't, <laughs> I don't that? remember who is getting probed? Uh, I don't know, the drummer maybe? One of the band members is getting probed. Um, and it's happening in front of all the other band members, so they must really be enjoying that. Um, and anyways, uh, so then the receptionist, uh, in a pretty funny scene, is like, 
why are you probing that guy? And Dr. Cyborg is kind of flustering. She's like, oh, well, it, it, because I, I, you just need to, you know? Um, and so it's kind of a running joke in the movie that Dr. Cyborg just likes to probe people. Um, <laughs> and he always talks about it. <laughs> yeah. Can you give us a Nope. Um, anyways, uh, then uh, the, her, her probing is unfortunately interrupted by breaking news on a microwave. Um, and this is the best news broadcast I've ever seen in my life. So the actual graphic of like breaking news, like the text is like, it looks like a poorly done, like iMovie thing. Um, and then even better, after that happens, the image of the news reporter is like squished. So he looks really like thin and tall. Um, and then uh, the news broadcast, how it happens is it shows some footage of Dylan's dad. And um, he's, the news broadcaster says, or the dad actually says, no one is above the law. And then the news broadcast ends. No, great, great ads for mayor. I yeah. Um, and then it immediately cuts to more mutato. So that was nice. Always need more mutato. Um, so anyways, then uh, um, Dr. Cyborg is, you know, looking to get revenge on Dylan. And she says, I'm going to take her face off uh, because she's mad that she got her own face taken off. I don't know uh, if we, it's, how that happened. I don't think we did. What's that? I don't think we mentioned how that happened. I think we free for you. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Well, that happens uh, with Alex, the barbed yeah. wire, uh, yeah. which Dylan wrapped around her knuckles and punched Dr. Cyborg in the face with. Yeah, and that's right. balanced on her head. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. the effect was actually pretty mild. There's, yeah, that. there's just, she's missing about like. She's basically just missing her chin, but she keeps talking like she doesn't have any face. Ignoring the giant metal thing on the rest of her face. Yeah, that I don't care about. But my chin, come on. <laughs> um, anyways, so then uh, they are escaping prison, and there's a pretty, you know, kind of clever or like nice looking scene where they each kind of poke their heads sequentially uh, out the doorway, um, and the tissue, the like mustache tissues, make it look even better. Um, also, I know, you know, this is a joke or whatever, but still, I, I, I don't think you can break out of a prison with the hair band. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> be pretty bomb. The, uh, the hairpin kind of hair band, not the Motley Crue kind of hair band. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Motley You probably could break out of prison with Motley Crue, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, just... Prison, to be honest, too, when you think... What's that? He would probably just break his up prison. <laughs> <laughs> they just offer like one of the cops, like, hey, you want to try this? The cop would be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Um, OK, so then there's some really nice sneaky music. Some nice, I don't know, stock music sounding over the top sneaky Pink Panther music while they're sneaking out of prison. Um, yeah. So then, but then they get almost to the front door and then they stop to talk to each other. Uh, and they are, um, they realize that the green goo, they need the green goo because that was the only thing that worked in terms of killing the cyborgs. It's the only permanent thing. Yeah, so then of course they decide we need to go to the evidence locker to get the goo. So they, they walk up to the evidence locker and they're like waiting outside. <laughs> this is one of the funniest scenes. They, they open the door and there's like eight cops just sitting in the room <laughs> and, and they just stare at them and they like slam the door and like hold it shut. And then they're like talking, deciding what to do. So I, I think uh, Eddie says she will distract them. Dylan, I don't really know. She kind of goes out to do her own thing. But the hair girl has to sneak back in and get the goo. So they open the door, and when they open the door, one of the cops just like <laughs> falls backwards. <laughs> and it's All of the falling in this movie is glorious because it's like it's so fake looking. 
<laughs> yeah. It's, there's no like, it's like really slow and like awkward and it's great. Um, so anyways, uh, then there's a little kind of chase scene, which is pretty funny. I think the cops have pretty good physical comedy of like, you know. They're definitely funnier parts of the, the movie, I think. Uh-huh. Um, and then there's a scene, uh, it's kind of a random, not really interesting scene, but I guess we'll talk about it. So there's a cop eating a tiny donut and then Dr. Cyborg kills the cop and the cop's facial expression is like a really like, like over the top scared expression, which was pretty funny. Um, and she was a decent screamer. Not many good screamers in this movie, but this cop was good. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and there's the fight with. Either that uh, or is it... important, actually, one unimportant scene. I don't know why it was in the movie, but uh, there's a scene where uh, a couple is engaging in an intimate activity. Uh, fully clothed on a filthy mattress in a random shed in the middle of the woods. <laughs> and um, you know, But they're rudely interrupted by Sheborg, who hasn't been in the movie for maybe like 20 minutes at this point. Um, and she grabs the guy and then kills him off screen. But then you see all of this like blood, all of, the, all of these guts like pouring onto the woman. Um, and it's a pretty clever little scene. I just yeah. have no idea why the couple was there doing what they were doing there. Random. Okay. Um, get that in there, you know. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, then um, Tommy Hellfire uh, shows up at the puppy farm and he sees a couple of cyborgs eating some puppies. He's like, hey, you know, that's that's odd. I guess I believe Dylan now. Um, and so he tries to shoot them, but uh, they're only mildly annoyed by it. In fact, one of them just says, you need therapy after it happens, which I laughed at pretty hard, actually. Um, and then we see our first Tommy Hellfire punching scene. And it's, I, I loved it. I laughed every single time he got punched in the face. Uh, because again, I mentioned all the punching in this movie looks really like fake and fast. Um, and so he's getting punched in the face like over and over again but at a ridiculously rapid rate. Um, and it's so funny. Yeah, it's a pretty great scene. Um, and then uh, before she punches him one time, and for the last time, she just kisses him for some reason. I'm not sure why. <laughs> and it wasn't like uh, they, were, they didn't comment on it or anything, it just happened. And then the scene ended. So that was odd. Yeah, it was a it was poor poor Tommy Hellfire. He was beaten and then sexually assaulted within the span of by a cyborg. Be a bias for even. Okay, yeah. so then uh, Dylan is in the police station doing something. I'm not sure what by herself um, when she runs into Doctor Cyborg, um, who grabs her. Um, and this might be the worst transition in the whole movie, which is saying something. Um, this had happened previously. It happened right after they left the puppy farm. And there was that's the perfect time for it. And what it is, is it's this kind of like when you change the channel on an old TV and there's like that little static thing that kind of happens. That's what it's like. And it works for the puppy farm because that's a really noticeable uh, type of transition that's definitely going to grab your attention. But it works for the puppy farm scene because that's a drastic change of location from somewhere you'd spent like the first 30 minutes of the movie to a new location. Um, and so you definitely need to establish that there's a dramatic change happening there. This, yeah. uh, they use the ch static channel changing effect again um, when Dr. Cyborg starts attacking Dylan, but they use it to cut to another angle of the fight, which is so incompetent. I don't know how it happened. And it's so distracting and it takes you out of the movie so much. It's, uh, it's, it's bizarre. Um, yeah. But that fight scene, uh, there was one really good part of it uh, where Dylan pushes uh, Dr. Cyborg off of a stairwell into like that empty space and she falls all the way down to the ground. And uh, I, in the credits, there's a sh there's, they're showing how they did that. And it was with a puppet, but it, it was like with a dummy. But it looks pretty good. I thought it was one of, it was, well, probably the best falling 
in the movie. Oh, definitely, definitely. They needed more dummies in this movie, I guess. Um, and yeah. that scene actually had a pretty funny uh, conclusion because Dr. Cyborg is just mildly inconvenienced by it. <clears throat> uh, anyways. Uh, so, um, then Dylan kind of hides away and Dr. Cyborg uh, is like, come out, come out. And then she starts describing how she's going to kill Dylan. And I'm just like, I'm going to tear your face off. And then I'm going <laughs> to probe you to death. And then if that doesn't work, I'm going to probe you some more. <laughs> um, and anyways, I thought that, I thought that Dr. Cyborg's obsession with both probing and Dylan, uh, I thought those were very funny because I thought the actress was very hammy and over the top and played it very well. Good job, Bernice. Uh-huh. So anyways, um, okay, so then they all escape. Uh, they all kind of meet up, Dylan and Eddie and Purple Hair Girl. And they all escape, yeah. and uh, as they leave the police station, Tommy Hellfire pulls up in his police car to help him out, because now he believes Dylan. Um, and uh, then we cut to this scene where Pink Scrubs uh, is at the power grid. And uh, I guess there's just one plug in the power grid. Um, and it's like an word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just like a, like a what you'd use to plug in a ceiling lamp. Um, and uh, not a ceiling lamp, a desk lamp. Uh, and uh, anyways, but it's been unplugged, so I don't know how the city's running. But um, uh, Pink Scrubs is like, yes. And her acting is really bad. And then she plugs it in, and it's super dramatic. And then the scene ends. Yeah. And it's, there's, it's so dense. There's so much going on. I can't even begin to describe it. Uh, there's the brevity. There's the wonderful performance. Uh, it's, it's delightful. It's a masterpiece. I think that now we're about at the halfway point. So should we introduce our sponsor for today? Let's that do that. Let's do that. All right. And mm. now word from our sponsor, my face boss. Have you ever been in an accident? Have you ever tripped and fallen onto a pile of nails? Have you ever dropped your phone on your face, causing you to get a skin graft? Have you ever gotten into a fight with an anarchist who punched you in the face with barbed wire knuckles, which ripped the bottom of your face off, causing you to wear a sack over your head to avoid public humiliation? I know I have, and if you have, we have the solution for you. Introducing My Face Plus, the first at-home facial reconstruction kit. With the help of My Face, you can go back to looking shiny and clean like the sheboard you know you really are. We asked 10 doctors if they would recommend MyFace, and 9 out of 10 said no. To get your hands on MyFace Plus, simply call 0118-999-881-999-119-72-53, and we'll send you your first kit for free. Side effects may include muscle spasms, disfigurement, blindness, loss of taste, and smell, and death. MyFace Plus does not guarantee results and does not recommend you use this product. And now back to the show. Okay, so uh, after that scene, um, uh, so then we uh, it is revealed uh, through a very dramatic shot uh, that the dad, um, Dylan's dad, uh, the politician, Mr. White Man, has been transformed into a cyborg. Um, and he is giving a speech to a large mob of cyborgs talking about how he's going to take over the world or whatever, um, when inconveniently, uh, the cop car, uh, driven by Tommy Hellfire, happens to stumble into this ordeal. Um, and they, Dylan and Eddie and Purple Haired Girl and Tommy Hellfire, get involved in what I like to call the shirtless fight. Um, because <laughs> even though every male character in the, sh in the fight, the cyborgs and Tommy Hellfire start off wearing shirts, at some point over the course of the fight, they lose all, all of them lose their shirts. There's not a single male with a shirt at the end of the fight. Well, except the mayor, but he's better. <laughs> we don't want to see him without a shirt. Like anyone? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Then, I lost I my notes. Hold on. Oh, okay. no. I believe at this point, uh, the mayor, like, captures Dylan, and he's, yeah. he's poking her, and, like, like, you're such a disappointment, like, you're a failure of a daughter and like no one else, no one's trying to help basically they kind of all leave her 
Yeah, so they're all running away from the mob, uh, the mob of like maybe 10 or 20 cyborgs. Um, and then they stumble into one frail looking old politician and they're like, nope, I'd rather take my chances with the mob. Um, yeah. And they all just abandon Dylan like great friends uh, while she's getting choked and might get killed. Um, but it's made up for it because uh, they during the fight, uh, uh, Tommy Hellfire just gets railed on for like, <laughs> Like, you know, uh, Eddie just kind of fights like one cyborg and then she finds a whip at some point and starts whipping it, which is weird. But uh, Tommy Hellfire has like five or six cyborgs that are like all ganging up on him. And like yeah. one of them will like run across the screen and punch him. And then another will run in the other direction and do the same. One of them punches him in the face like 30 times in a row really fast. Um, and it's really funny. Yeah. Then uh, I believe they get in the cop car again yeah okay well um they ripped the wires out of all of the cyborgs in a montage that would have been cool if the cyborgs didn't look so passive while it was happening like they're literally just standing still for a solid like two seconds before they get their wires pulled out <laughs> and anyways and then dylan um after being choked for a solid minute when she could have easily escaped pulls her dad's wires out um, very what's that it's a very emotional scene it is, it is. Dylan, uh, her actress was very good and she pulled off the emotional heft of this scene and then some of the scenes with Eddie that are a little bit more dramatic very well. Um, so now they get in the cop car and they're driving away and I believe they're also being chased by more uh, cyborgs at this point. Probably. Probably. Yeah, Probably. so I think cyborgs come and they, they crash into a tree and it's like this cool shot. Uh, there's like the tree right here, and then the car is like coming, and the tree's kind of like it's more curved, so they like ride up the tree almost and like mm -hmm. fall. I think, and it was practically done, which is really awesome. You don't see yes. that in movies. Yeah, in the bloopers, you can see that it was they actually drove the car up a tree. Yeah, it was um, pretty yeah, it was really convincing because it actually happened, and it it was a really surprisingly awesome effect um so anyways uh yeah the next scene i think they all kind of escape from that predicament and uh they all go to one of their apartments uh the one with the giant apple logo in the foreground um because they're all kind of talking and one of them's yeah i think it's a uh, purple haired girl is like you know typing stuff on her laptop and yep. there's a giant apple logo in the foreground of the shot that makes it look like it was sponsored by apple but it i mean obviously it wasn't because it cost twenty thousand dollars but um and then there's also a really distracting water bottle just like right in the foreground of the shot um, <laughs> so that was definitely an example of like how not to frame a shot ever um but anyways uh, at this point dylan is starting to get cold feet about the whole saving the world thing um, but Eddie kind of convinces her that, you know, that's in her heart, it's her spirit, and she's got to do it. Um, and I thought that that was a very well acted scene. Um, a little, a small note Tommy Hellfire is still shirtless. He doesn't have a shirt. He is still shirtless. They ask him to put on a shirt, and he refuses. Uh -huh. uh, so, yeah, but I, I did appreciate how his character was kind of a parody of the typical, like, action movie hero character. Uh, yeah, a couple more jokes later on in the movie. Um, at this point, it's revealed that um, Giborg's grand plan is to have this huge signal sent off into space. Um, and she's powering it with the power grid. Um, and so Dylan and Eddie, all uh, the gang, we'll just call them the gang, have discovered that this is the case. And they all decide to go to the signal to stop it from happening. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, uh, then they all show up at the signal, and Good Cop or not Good Cop Tommy Hellfire has this very over-the-top heroic pose with like his chest kind of puffed out and his arms back. Uh, yeah, exactly. He's kind of scoping out the scene, but then he's interrupted when a uh, purple-haired girl just shoves a, a duffel bag like into his chest, and he kind of goes, "Oh." Uh, which I thought was another funny little parody of the typical action pose. Um, but uh, sad news. Uh, it turns out Dylan is not going to be joining them in their 
uh, adventure to turn off the signal because she's got to deal with the power grid situation. Um, and she reveals this when she's like smoking a cigar for some reason, like a, a, a an over the top giant cigar that looks like Al Capone would be smoking it, <laughs> um, which kind of uh, kind of made the emotional scene where Eddie has to like, you know, kind of say goodbye to Dylan because they might not make it out of this. Uh, it definitely maybe decreased the uh, the value of that scene just a little bit, the giant cigar. Um, but anyways, uh, so Dylan goes to the power grid, but it turns out it's not going to be a piece of cake. It's not going to be as easy as just unplugging it because Dr. Cyborg is there and Dr. Cyborg is very mad at this point. Uh, would you like to describe how that fight scene transpires, Tebow? Yes, this is, I'm surprised Dylan survived, to be honest, because I think, I don't remember what the first thing that happens to her is. I'm not sure if she is, she punched by Dr. Cyborg? She gets, okay, so Dr. Cyborg gets the upper hand on her, and she's about to cut off Dylan's face. She starts to. Yes, yes. So she is, like, cutting her chin, and it's, it's really, there's, like, blood dripping. It was crazy. I, I, I thought she slit her throat, and I was like, oh, well, she just died. <laughs> uh, Anticlimactic. <laughs> if that wasn't bad enough, uh, Dr. Cyborg takes Dylan and puts her head in a car door and then slams it like four times. Somehow Dylan doesn't die. I don't know how, but apparently she is just as powerful as the cyborgs. So yeah, she, I, I don't remember exactly what happens after that. I think that um, then I think we come back to the signal fight scene um, where they're trying to figure out exactly what to do and Purple Hair Girl suggests to Hellfire like a uh, can't you just run up there and you know and start punching people or whatever? It's like, ah, oh, that sounds like cardio. I don't do cardio. Um, so which I thought was a funny little clever little moment. Um, but uh, purple haired girl has her own ideas and decides to try to be diplomatic uh, with the cyborgs. But that doesn't end go over very well because Cyborg's response to her offer of friendship is simply, "We do not make friends with our food." It's a pretty, it's a pretty- Pretty cool. It's better than chaos provides. <laughs> yeah, they say that. We didn't mention that. They're the cyborgs like catchphrase is chaos provides, which is kind of a stupid line. Pretty much uh, all it says is chaos provides. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then anyways, after that happens, uh things just start going crazy. Everybody's getting punched in the face, everybody's fighting. Um, the crotch kicking is out of control at this point. There's been a few crotch kicks in this movie before this, but at this point, it's insane. There's maybe, maybe like five or six in a row. Um, anyways, um, so uh, um, then I think we get the uh, conclusion of, we cut back to Dylan and Dr. Cyborg, um, and Dylan has miraculously survived. Yes. Um, and so she kind of crawls her way into the car, and uh, exacts her final revenge on Dr. Cyborg. She drives over her like 10 times. <laughs> which I she, Yes, she, she drives over her, backs up, drives over her again, and just uh, keeps doing it. <laughs> it's actually a pretty funny scene, the way they, they film it. <laughs> like from the side, to see the car going back forwards and back. <laughs> pretty yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It was a good um, like, for Dr. Cyborg. So anyways, uh, then uh, we see uh, uh, Dylan and Seaborg are kind of in a final standoff and, uh, or not Dylan, Eddie, sorry. God. Uh, anyways, and Eddie had previously mentioned somewhere in the movie that she knows Kung Fu. Um, and here she proves that she knows Kung Fu by doing uh, an embarrassingly like low quality karate kid kick, you know? Um, yeah. The flying crane, I think it's called. Uh, where you put your arms up and you kick them, um, and it, it looks like, like a, just like if I tried to do one, you know, someone who has no training in karate. Um, but you know, it works, I guess. It, it temporarily incapacitates Sheborg, and uh, at this point, uh, both the power grid uh, and the signal are shut down. Uh, so things are looking up. 
unfortunately, things don't end up very well for one character. Yeah. Well, two characters, really. So, uh, during the fight, Eddie, uh, not Eddie, sorry, Purple Haired Girl was unfortunately shot and killed. I believe she dies. I'm not entirely sure because they never like show her body. They just kind of imply that she dies. So she's shot by Sheborg, and then uh, that's when Eddie incapacitates her. And then Eddie's celebrating, and in a heart in a heart wrenching moment, this was actually genuinely very sad. Yes, uh, rips Eddie's heart out. I believe is what happens, and you don't yeah. see the that you just see like Eddie's face, like like yeah. you know. And then you see Seaboy holding a plastic heart. <laughs> It was, it was actually very sad. I almost, like... It was, was sad, yeah. Here. It was... And I think at this point, also, uh, Dylan is just pulling up in her car when she sees this happen. Yeah. So, that also, was... Also, it's important to note that on top of, just to add, I don't know, extra insult to injury, she word rips out Dylan's tongue, or Eddie's tongue. Before she does that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so Dylan is very upset, very distraught by this, and uh, starts attacking uh, Sheborg. Um, and Dylan gets zapped by Sheborg, which Sheborg doesn't zap too many people in the movie. But I guess when she does, it makes a fart noise because she zaps Dylan and it, it makes a fart noise. I don't know. I think the editor just got bored um, and tried to <laughs> throw in a joke. <laughs> but uh, um, anyways, there was the fart noise in the trailer. I guess that's true. Yeah. But so, um, so, yeah, Dylan is being like zapped. And then I think she does something to kill Sheborg at this point. I don't know. Really she does a somersault um, for no reason whatsoever. She's like running towards Sheborg and then just kind of pauses to do a somersault before doing her final attack on Sheborg. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what transpires, but somehow Sheborg ends up on fire um and then dies yeah and then we have the final scene in the movie which is a, a bit of a flash forward um and we see dylan um in a post-apocalypse <laughs> still spray painting anarchy symbols um and uh then uh tommy hellfire shows up says something like okay you know let's go or whatever um, and they drive off in their van, uh, which has a cyborg head tied to the back of it. It's a pretty cool. It's pretty cool. The oh, final shot is actually quite impressive because it shows the van driving away and it pans up to the sky and you can see all these ships like landing and it's pretty cool. Yeah, so basically the world is post-apocalyptic now. And there's uh, like, so Sheborg's message did go through sadly. They were too late. So all this, all, there's a bunch of Sheborgs arriving. Mm -hmm. And brings up an interesting point. I I wonder if Sheborgs has like if the like Sheborgs planet has like male cyborgs or if it's just all it's like a just like hmm. a bunch of women cyborgs. We never really yeah. see, yeah. Any like I mean, obviously men get turned into like minions of Sheborg throughout the movie, but I don't I don't know. I assume you know you never know. I'm mean, like, how do cyborgs? The big question. How do they reproduce? Yeah. I guess so. Yeah, that's not what I was thinking about when I watched this movie, but you don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay. So then we have the credits, which are actually quite, probably the most entertaining credits of any movie I've seen. Um, because first off, we get bloopers, um, which is always great, great way to end the movie. Even though one of the bloopers, for some reason, is like at the very end, it just shows a bunch of clappers going off and like people snapping and stuff. I don't know what's supposed to be funny or weird about it, but uh, there's also um, uh, in the credits, there's a section for rad songs from bands. Um, and then one is special thanks, S-P-E-S-H. And uh, then they have a, a final message, a uh, final thank you message, which is amazing. Uh, and it is after the special thanks section at the bottom, it says, and a bunch of other people far too numerous to T O O mention, but who are nevertheless most rad and awesome. Yeah. Um, and then we get our, our post credits. Yeah, we do. Do you, do you want to? 
probably remember it more than you. Okay, so uh, it turns out that Eddie is now a cyborg. You know what? Was because I, now I just remembered watching that and I was like, who's the cyborg? So it Eddie. is, that's Eddie. See, that cleared it up for me. Oh, that. Yeah. So she's a cyborg and she says something, but it's inaudible because the audio is, I don't know, ridiculously quiet. I mean, for some reason, I guess if you get your heart ripped out by keyboard or something, you become a full cyborg because she's got like an arm and like all this extra stuff. Um, she's also turned into a goth because she's got like, like black eyeshadow and like the goth like makeup. It's bizarre. Um, and then the movie ends. So maybe we'll get a sequel. Hopefully we'll get a sequel one day about Eddie as a, as a cyborg versus post apocalyptic villain. Everyone uh, listening or watching to this, uh, make sure you email the director, Daniel Armstrong. Well, if we find his email, we'll, uh, uh, we'll post it on the, the, the Bullpup Broadcasting site. Make sure to email him to uh, get him to make a sequel because we want to see a sequel. We need to start a fundraiser at the school for Sheboard 2. We'll fund me for, for Sheboard 2. Yes. Um, All right. So what did you think? Would you, is it so bad it's bad or is it so bad it's good? I am going to go, I'm going to even say that this is so good it's good. Really? I genuinely enjoyed this. It's not a great movie technically, but it's a really, really fun movie. And I really admired it because it felt like it was, it wasn't like a movie that was intentionally bad or in anything but just a, a bunch of friends kind of having fun and making a movie even though they don't have a lot of money and uh, they're a little bit self-aware about it but they don't go like too self-aware about it which can happen um and so i really enjoyed it how about you i'm gonna i'm gonna not i'm not gonna go so good it's good but i'm gonna say sure. like so decent it's good which decent does okay. that means better than bad like it's it's a oh definitely and it reminds me a lot of Thanks Killing, which is in the similar thing where it's just a bunch of friends having fun. You know, they don't have a lot of money. This one had a bigger budget, I believe. So they maybe maybe we don't want Sheboard too, because when they made a sequel to Thanks Killing. Three, I mean I think is what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, so I, I'm I'm gonna say that yeah, so decent it's good. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, should we have some fun? Should we read some reviews now? Our, our little uh, trivia question. Oh, yeah. I, I, what is that? I don't know what that is. I have one. Um, okay. A fictional show, <laughs> Mut- who is, uh, I guess, Mutato is the Sheborg. Well, the Sheborg is fighting something. In, in the in the mutato animation what is that something and you can just describe it to the best of your ability so email yes. that to so bad it's bad one at gmail.com yes. um, uh, let's so uh, first off our first review comes from a critic uh, and this comes from what is it girls with guns.org it's dot org it's very yeah, cool girls with guns. Org. it focuses um, on feeds they- in uh, B movies, so you should check that site out. It's pretty cool. Yeah, check it out. Um, so they give this movie three and a half stars out of five. Um, and some of the highlights from the review state um, it is better than Daniel Armstrong's last movie, which is called From Parts Unknown, and it's apparently about zombie wrestlers. And I still want to watch it, even if it's not as good as this one. Um, they c- compare it to the early works of Peter Jackson, which Peter Jackson, before he made Lord of the Rings, made a lot of low budget horror movies like. Uh, bad taste and that sort of stuff dead alive um they said it was rare to find uh b movies with strong female characters like this movie has both good and bad um they complain that sheborg isn't in it enough which i agree with um and they claim that it does a good job of not taking itself too seriously um and for the fight scenes they are a little conflicted because the editing is good according to them, but the skill of the actors is kind of limited. Um, and they say it's tolerable, but you definitely have to be into B-movies to really get a lot out of it. Yes, I, I think that that is the perfect review. I think it pretty much encapsulates, encapsulates our feelings about the movie. Yeah, totally. Now we can go to our audience ratings. Um, do you want to read the good rating that we had on IMDb? I will. 
So this is a nine out of 10. And the, uh, I've never caught this before. Uh, the uh, title of the review is We Do Not Make Friends With Our Food. Um, and it's by Self Destructo 25 from December 2021. Uh, and it goes like this. How could I not watch? How, oh, how could I not not watch a movie? That's weird. Called Seaborg. Uh, if you like crazy alien invasion B movies um, with awesome Aussie ladies, then this one's for you. They get plenty of bang for their buck, uh, budget twenty thousand, with sheer creativity and fun writing. The action slash violence sequences in this are highly stylized, with clever use of editing and some CG enhancements. I've never seen a car drive up a tree, and unpractically. Some minor, some major continuity errors. All is forgiven. This movie is a great deal of fun. Did I mention awesome chicks? Lots of low budget charm. I went so far as to upgrade my Dollar Tree DVD to a Blu-ray of this flick. Uh, I didn't even know that. I didn't know they made Blu-rays of this. <laughs> Seaborg, yeah, I need one. <laughs> Buy one of those. That was a lucky find at the Dollar Tree then. <laughs> yeah, right. that is let's hear our okay let's hear so our bad review. Rated four out of ten. Their title was Amusing But Stupid, and it was written by, I'm not even going to attempt to say this, I'm just going to spell it out, F-D-U-N-I-H-O dash 3880326. Uh, so it's Dunahoe 388. Um, and this is also- is that, a, is that a cyborg? Is that a cyborg name? Probably. It's, yeah, it's the little cyborg ID number. That's why they gave it a negative review, because it's bad. It's, it's negative slander <laughs> against cyborgs. It wasn't realistic enough uh, so this was for 2021 so which is kind of funny the higher and the high some one of the highest and lowest ratings were from december 2021 so i guess it had a boost in popularity then people are still watching it yeah i mean as long as people are talking about it it's gonna be there maybe this is when they put it on prime maybe they put it on prime in 2021 that makes some sense so basically the review goes like this uh, i laughed out loud when i thought when i saw the title sheboard then I remembered that one of my favorite movies is about a female cyborg, so I thought I would try this out for sake of comparison. Unlike Alita Battle Angel, which portrays a female cyborg with depth and humanity, this movie portrays a female cyborg as an alien monster who must be. This character is more like Godzilla. To underscore what kind of movie this is, some scenes show fake characters watching what appears to be a very low-budget Japanese monster movie with fake-looking monster monsters rampaging among model buildings. Are they insulting? Are they insulting mutating? Oh. <laughs> How dare they blasphemy? <laughs> Anyways, um, the Sheborg even has less depth and humanity than Daleks and Cybermen sometimes have on Doctor Who. The special effects are virtually non-existent. The Sheborg has robot parts on one side that give her a lopsided gait. In the scene to, in which she moves the most, she crawls out of a window like Samara from The Ring crawling out of a TV screen. <laughs> Most of the actual action scenes do not involve her, which is very true. Um, yeah, true. <laughs> this movie rips off Bill and Ted and Scooby-Doo. I don't think rips off. I think more like pays homage to. Yeah. The two characters, two girls named Dylan and Eddie, repeatedly copy a gesture made famous by Bill and Ted in which they bump fists, wiggle their fingers, and make weird woo-woo noises. They are joined by a third character who looks like we do, and in fact yes. is named Velma. So her name That's was That's the Velma. most accurate thing I've ever heard in my life. She looks exactly <laughs> like Velma. Her name is Velma. I did not know that. We probably should have read that before, before calling her purple haired girl the whole time. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, being taller and having red hair, Dylan looks like some looks something like Daphne in comparison. Oh, every tall, red-haired female is, looks like Daphne. Uh, there is also a male character who is something like Shaggy. What the hell? That's, oh, that's they're, right. they're really stretching the Scooby-Doo thing thin there. If they think Tommy Hellfire is anything like Shaggy. I think this... Here's about dogs. When does he say anything about dogs? That's, or are they talking about Rick? They're talking about Rick, not Hellfire. Who did you think they oh, were talking about? Oh, I thought they were talking about Hellfire for some reason. Oh, oh no, no. I don't think Rick really fits the Shaggy thing either, though. Uh, I guess I can kind of see that. I mean, Shaggy is kind of a stoner, and Rick is uh, a little bit more than a stoner, but, you know. I don't, I don't it's a little far. It's a little tiny bit of a stretch. I don't, I don't think it's as bad as, like, Dylan, like, Daphne. 
that's really yeah especially i mean the personalities couldn't be more different yeah um, i do think the velma is a very accurate one especially because he's like kind of nerd you know and, mm -hmm. yeah i i think all right so i think that's everything right yeah that's pretty much it so so uh thank you very much for watching uh i hope you check out she worked on amazon prime and uh i hope you have a great day i hope you check out all the other content on both of broadcasting.com See ya tomorrow, maybe. I'm making another podcast tomorrow, which we won't. Bye. <laughs> I mean, maybe.